Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. I'm James Messer, and in this course, we're going to talk about an introduction to personal computers. This comes directly from the CompTIA exam objectives, section 1.1, which talks about using personal computers. The idea is that we need to be able to understand what's inside of these systems to be able to do any maintenance, any troubleshooting, and understand a little bit more about it. So this is going to be a good introduction that goes through the outside of the personal computer, what's on the outside and what we can expect to see. We're going to open up a system. We're going to look inside. I'm going to show you what's on the inside of a system. And finally, we're going to go through the overview, uh, just a short primer on how this computer operation really occurs using all of these different components. Let's start with the outside. What is in the outside of a computer system? Well, when we start looking at a computer, there are a number of things that are, seem to be universal. They seem to find it on every computer that we run across. The first would be the monitor. We have to have some way to see what's in front of us and what we're working with. And the monitor provides that functionality for us. The view here on the picture that I have is one of an LCD monitor, but the monitors can be very small. They can be very large. They can be a cathode ray tube. They can be an LCD, but the purpose is still the same. It's showing us a display of what we would expect to see coming from that computer system. We also have some type of interface on a keyboard in most cases, and the keyboard's going to allow us to type in and see. Uh, provide us access into the input of that system. So whereas the monitor was giving us an output of what's there, the keyboard is an input device, very much like our mouse is. The keyboard's giving direct input on the letters, and the mouse is allowing us to move the cursor around the screen to be able to act and react to what we're seeing there. And finally, we have the computer itself. Sometimes you'll hear this refer referred to as the CPU. You need to turn on and off your CPU. But in reality, there's a lot more inside of that device than a CPU. So calling it a very generic term, the computer itself, is probably the best way to go about it as we go through this road of understanding more about the way all of these systems work. Now the inside's a little bit different. There's a lot more details inside. That's where all the magic happens. So what I did was I pulled apart one of the systems that I have here in my office. And this system is one that is a server. So a lot of the components in here are flattened out so that the device itself has a very narrow profile. It fits into, it's designed to fit into a rack. And so it's, it's very short in the way that it fits, but it's extremely long. And because it's so long, we can see a lot of the components a lot easier. Uh, hopefully when we're done with this, you'll unplug your computer. You'll open up the case of your system and look inside for these components as well. And you'll probably see them jumbled a, a together a lot closer than you're seeing them on my screen. Well, let's start with what powers this entire system. And that's the power supply. We can see that at the bottom left. That power supply on the back side of it facing the outside has a place where we can plug in our power cord so we can get power from the wall. And the power supply is what's responsible for providing power to the motherboard, providing power to our hard drives and floppy drive systems, and anything else that might be inside of our computer. You can see on the, the right side of that, that power supply, uh, there are some black wires, some yellow wires, and some red wires coming out of that. And those are those, those wires we were discussing that the power is coming out of the power supply at particular voltages and providing that to other components in the system. And if you followed them back, you'd see some plugged into the motherboard. Others were plugging into our floppy drives and our hard drives. Another component that's incredibly important to our computer, wouldn't be able to run it without it, is the motherboard. And the motherboard itself has a lot of different components on there. We're going to talk about those in just a moment. But you'll find the motherboard's this very large green uh, green device with all of these different components on it. And it really is the heart of any computer. Some motherboards are very large. Some are very small. The one that I have in this particular system is a relatively standard size that we happen to have. And there's a lot of different components on the motherboard. And we'll step through some of those. The, the first one is the CPU, the central processing unit. In my particular case with this server, mine has two CPUs on it. In most people's home desktops and their laptop computers, they generally only have a single CPU. You can't really see the CPUs in my motherboard here because they have fans on top of them. And that's pretty standard these days with the modern CPUs. They get very, very hot. So one way that we use to cool those CPUs is we'll just stick a fan right on top of it. And that's going to run all the time. Those fans can also be designed to run faster as the CPU gets hotter. So these are very often very smart in the way that they operate. 
Also on the motherboard, you'll find memory. This memory chips and the way that they're designed are different depending on the motherboard that you'll run into. There's a lot of different standards for memory. When we get to our memory module of the Professor Messer video training course, what you'll find is that there's a lot of different kinds of memory. So you have to make sure you get the right kind for the motherboard. On my motherboard, notice that the memory sits sideways and it plugs into the interface slots at an angle. It's not that way on every motherboard. Some of the memory sticks stick straight up. Others are using different methods to plug into the motherboard. We talked earlier about cooling fans that are on our CPU, but just as our CPUs get very hot, the entire computer and all of these different chips that are running also get hot as well. And so you'll find on your systems, almost every single computer you'll run into, there are cooling fans. My particular server I have here has one, two, three different cooling fans on it. And so you'll You'll find on your desktop machines uh, that you're using at home, it may only have one cooling fan. These days, there are some very, very specialized systems that have no cooling fans on them, very small computers that are designed for very specific purposes. But in most, most computers you're going to find, and certainly in servers and desktop computers, you're going to find there's quite a few cooling fan opportunities there. And sometimes they're big fans, sometimes they're small fans, but it's always nice to have them pull the data pull the 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 air into the cool air into the system and blow the warmer air out of the system which is exactly the way those cooling fans are designed to work in the front of my computer are the storage drives and the ones on the bottom that we see here are the floppy drives those floppy drives are there and unfortunately, they're a dying breed. You don't see very many floppy drives on systems anymore. But this particular server not only has a floppy drive on it, it also has a hard drive on it. And the hard drive has multiple hard drives on this particular system. It's designed to have some redundancy. So there's multiple drives. They're used in an array. And we'll talk more about hard drives and the way that we protect that data in a, a different video module. But on this system, that's where those hard drives are. And on your system, it's probably very similar. There's probably a, a metal case that your drive sits in or that your drive is attached to that's designed to fit the perfect size for a hard drive, fit in that case that you have. One component you're going to find on every computer system is something called the Basic Input Output System, or BIOS. And the BIOS is usually this tiny little chip that's installed on the motherboard. This BIOS is also called flash memory because a BIOS is something that in the newer systems in the, the last 10 years or so, computers have been designed so that you can update the BIOS through software. It used to be when you wanted to update the BIOS, you'd have to pull the chip off the motherboard and replace it with a physically separate chip. I've zoomed in on my BIOS so you can see exactly what it looks like. But there it is. It is designed so you could pull it off and put it back on again. But in my case, it can also be flashed so that I can add new versions of the BIOS onto my motherboard anytime I wanted to. Now, next to the BIOS, you'll see there are some expansion slots there, too. I'll zoom up on those so you can see them. The expansion slots are designed, very much like their name is, to expand the capabilities of your system. If you wanted to add a more high-powerful video card or you wanted to add additional USB ports into this system, you could buy an extra card that would pop right onto the motherboard, slides right in, and attaches. And then I would have that additional capability associated with it. You'll notice on this motherboard that there are some expansion cards that are facing up. There's also some expansion cards, it's hard to see from this view, that are facing away from us at a, a different angle. Well, we'll talk more about riser cards and their purpose in these types of systems in a later module. But it's nice to have this so you can see there are differences in expansion slots. There's differences in the sizes. There's also differences in how they sit inside of your system. Now that we've seen the inside and the outside of the computer, let's approach it at a little bit higher perspective. How do all of these things work together? Well, a very basic flowchart of the way a computer works is one that I've drawn here. Before a computer can do anything, you have to provide it with some input. So you can see our input at the top is providing that capability. So we've got a way that we can use our keyboard to provide input. We can use our mouse to provide input. We can also take input and provide it through uh, other systems that are in the system. It may not just be a mouse and keyboard, but it just has to be a way to get some type of information into the system itself. At the center of this picture, you'll notice there's a processing box that I've got. That is not just the central processing unit of the system, but that is a representation of all of the different processes that occur 
inside that that motherboard because it has to be able to receive the input, has to have a way to provide output of that. It has to have a way to think about what it's receiving and perform calculations to it. And so there's always some processing that must take place. During this processing phase, there may also be a transfer in and out of some type of storage. And we've already seen different kinds of storage on the motherboard I showed you. There was memory where you can temporarily store information. There are hard drives where you can store information over longer periods of time. And I even had floppy drives in my system where I can store the information, take it out of my computer, take it to a different computer, put it in that floppy drive, and have that as a new storage system on that new computer. Finally, you see there's an output setting. And the output is going to be there so that we can see what the computer has done. That output might be to our screen, which is a very common way to receive the output. We want to see what we've done and see the results of that. We could also have it come out on a printer. That's another nice output. But that computer operation is a process that's occurring many times across many different components on your system at millions and millions and millions of times per second. So this com basic computer operation uses all of those different components we saw in our computer. And they're all working to perform that common goal that you've sent your computer to provide reading your email, to provide looking at this particular presentation, or anything else you need your computer to do. Well, that's a summary of our introduction to personal computers. We've looked on the outside of a computer, and we understand what those components are like. We pop the top off a computer. Maybe you'll do that to yours next. And look to see all the different components that are on the inside. And we also went through those basic four elements of computer operation, the input, the processing, the storage, and the output. Well, that ends this module on our introduction to personal computers. If you'd like to comment on this video, send messages to other CompTIA professionals, or look at any of our other free A-plus training videos, be sure to visit our website, freeaplus.com.